I'm so over here. Which is farther, Orlando or Sardinia? Sardinia. And away we go. Um, okay, so we're going to go pretty quickly through animal reproduction, and it includes all sorts of possibilities. You need to know some of it, a uh, fair bit of it, actually. Um, oh, this was about that initial picture. So these earthworms here, whoops, where are those earthworms? There they are. Earthworm sex. It's true. Uh, earthworm sex is decidedly different than... For example, human sex, um, the earthworms are hermaphrodites, so they both have male and female reproductive parts, so they have s sex with each other simultaneously. Oh, we about that yeah, we talked about it. If you're, if you're an earthworm, you don't have to consider the gender of your um, potential partner because, um, because they're all male and all female. Um, very convenient. I think that that thing on the earthworm, that sort of thick yellowish band at either end is called the clitellum, and that's, I believe, where the reproductive organs, that's how that, that's Those what that worms? segment of the worm is. Those two worms? Two worms. Meeting. All right. So, um, and then they'll fertilize the eggs, um, and they will lay, they will release the eggs immediately, and that's one of the themes that you want to think about with animal reproduction. So internal. where, yeah, internal versus external fertilization. Do they lay eggs or do they hold the eggs inside? There are a variety of different possibilities. Um, so we'll continue on. Um, so when you're thinking sexual reproduction, if you're putting two gametes together, it doesn't matter if those gametes are made by the same individual or two different individuals, although they're usually two different individuals, it's sexual reproduction. You have mixed up the DNA. Remember, making gametes by meiosis mixes up the DNA. You have, you're making gametes and you're, every time, uh, and, and we'll go with sperm as the example because your eggs are kind of hanging right now. Um, I mean, they're, you're releasing maybe one every 28 days, but it's not going all the way through meiosis unless you get fertilized, and I'm assuming that hasn't happened yet. Um, but every sperm, if you do the math, is going to wind up different, the DNA. Every single one, all of the hundreds of billions of sperm that you produce will wind up being slightly different than every other one, pretty much, because of crossing over. Not only are you taking one out of each of your pair of your parents' chromosomes, so that gives you two to the 23rd possibilities, but then you also can mix and match the chromosomes um, within that and, and, and make sort of a conglomeration of chromosome one and chromosome two that never happens quite the same way twice um, because each you have six billion places where the crossing over can happen. It's, it's, that's the cool thing. That's why no two siblings look exactly alike. They're only, except unless they're identical twins. And even identical twins don't look exactly alike, which is interesting. Um, if you don't take sperm and eggs and put them together, it's asexual. And we'll see a variety of organisms that can do that. Um, it is. Um, so some of the invertebrates can produce, reproduce asexually by fission. Um, <coughs> An, an individual just splits into two and grows into two individuals. Planaria can do that. You can disrupt a planaria into like hundreds of pieces, and each of the hundreds of pieces will give rise to a whole new planaria. Can they spell themselves? Yes, but they don't do it that often. Is that like starfish? Too? Yeah, but starfish, you don't... Yes, it is true for starfish, but that you can't disrupt them as much as planaria. Oh. You, you, you can't... A starfish won't grow just from like the tip of a tentacle. You have to have... Some, Part of the central. Per, yeah, some percentage of the central disc. That was an embarrassing story. So as we've said before, starfish, voracious, voracious shellfish, say that 10 times fast, voracious shellfish predators. So who gets annoyed by that? Human shellfish fishermen. So what do they do? They catch all the starfish, and they cut them up and throw them overboard. Uh, more, more, more starfish. Yeah, it's like the sorcerer's apprentice with the broomstick and... Well, yeah, you you can take them out of the water and, but you might as well, 
But you know what you know what happens though? And here's here's the other piece. Starfish tend to be a keystone species in marine ecosystems. Have we talked about keystone species? Yeah, we might maybe do. So a keystone species is a species that's by its presence in an ecosystem significantly influences the um, the number and distribution of other species in the ecosystem. So a starfish, by being around and sort of eating shellfish all day long, um, makes it so that it opens up new shellfish habitat. Because the thing for a shellfish is to find that one great spot to stick to so that the water currents are just right and the tides are just right and everything's just right. Well, once you're stuck there, you're golden and you can just live your whole life out there. But what the, 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 the starfish are coming along and saying, nope, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead. And that opens up habitat for new shellfish to come in. It also means that you have a, a more different species of shellfish in one given area if you have starfish. If you take all the starfish out, you tend to get like a monoculture, like one will dom the mussels will dominate over the oysters and the so clams. Starfish, starfish kind of goes through and randomizes a little bit. Um, so that's a keystone species. A keystone species around here, um, you could certainly argue that the pine tree is a keystone species around here because the the pine trees tend to dictate the forest structure. They produce pine cones which feed certain animals like squirrels and other birds, so that's the animals you tend to find there. They also shade out other plants so that <coughs> you, only certain plants can live with pine trees, so it determines those species. They also acidify the soil so that only some species can live there. Blueberries grow really well in Maine, because of the pine trees, one could argue, because Maine has fairly acidic soil. Don't try to grow blueberries right up against the foundation of your house, because the concrete from your house will leach out um, small amounts of base, and the, apple, the blueberries won't be so happy. They want acidic soil. So that's what I mean by a keystone species. Um, all right, so you can just split. This looks like a sea anemone, if I'm going to... Um, yeah, oh yeah, I see it. It's, I get the picture now. It's splitting. You can see two coming from one right in the middle of the picture is the skinny part. I got skinny. That's so cool. Um, some can bud. Uh, hydra. Again, we talked about Nigerians last time. Uh, a hydra is a little tiny. You can see them under the microscope. It's a little... Uh, it's called a hydra named after the hydra, you know, from the mythological beast. Mm -hmm. They are uh, sessile. They are stuck to the ground. And they, they're, you know, they're microscopic. They have little five tentacles. They have five-part radial symmetry. One, two, three, four, five, four, six, if you can't draw. All right, five tentacles. And they have a little mouth opening. And um, when these guys want to reproduce, they produce a little tiny, you know, And eventually that breaks off and forms a new, that's called a bud. Is that kind of like what the, um, was it the jellyfish? Or the thing that like grows like the arm and then legs? Uh, that's not Similar? necessarily budding. I'm not sure how that, quite so how that works. Microscopic, do they just like watch these guys for days and days and days? No, you, 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 you can buy a culture of them, put them under the microscope, you'll find some that are budding. Yeah, you don't, no, you don't just watch the whole thing play out because it's hard to keep them hydrated and, and nutrished um, under a microscope. But you can watch them. Um, I know I did this with a class once. I got Hydra and I got Daphnia, which are a, a water flea. It's a little crustacean. And that's what Daphnia, one of the things that Daphnia will eat. So these, I mean, one of the things that Hydra will eat. So the Hydra is sitting there going like this. And the Daphnia comes in and it gets like harpooned. And then you can watch it actually pull the thing in and swallow it. And the Daphne has a single red eye spot. And you can watch the, the whole thing just slowly disappear and the eye spot disappear. And then it's all gone. And then they spit out the remains. I don't want to. Later. All right. So um, Hydra um, can, can bud. Um, fragmentation is what more like what planaria, uh, paramecia do, where, no, planaria do, where they can break and the parts can regrow. Um, <clears throat> lizards can't reproduce by fragmentation. They can regenerate a tail, but they can't, you can't like chop a lizard in half and grow two lizards. Tail, 
Right, 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 exactly. That's uh, important. Um, oh, yeah, and Parthenogenesis is just awesome. Maybe someday you guys will have the ability to do Parthenogenesis, although that makes me nervous. That will mean that males will become suddenly obsolete and we'll have all sorts of weirdness. Although I believe in honeybees, when, female, when a queen bee produces, reproduces by parthenogenesis, she produces males. And then, and drones, right. And then she'll mate with males and then fertilize her eggs and lay lots of fertile eggs which become females. So gender in honeybees is far more bizarre from our perspective, which is not necessarily a good perspective in this case. And, and all of the females that she produces will be sterile unless they're fed a special mixture of proteins and things called queen jelly. And so there's this like this whole... Weird. Oh, it's so weird. You have this so you have this hive of bees and all the bees that you see are half-sisters. They all have the same mother, but maybe not the same father. So that's the workers and the female. So it's an all-female hive. Um, in the in the in the fall, when the fem when the queen is done mating with any kind of male, the workers will actually take the males out of the hive and drop them off somewhere to die because they don't want to feed them over the winter. Yeah, being a male bee is mm -mm. oh bee movie, terrible movie. The biology is so completely awfully wrong at so many levels. It's almost as bad as Barnyard where the male cows have nipples, uh, have udders. But the oh, bee movie, God, the bees in the hive are male and they're getting pollen and, it, and at the end any pollen can fertilize any plant, which is wrong. You have to have species-specific pollen. Pollen is not a general thing. Oh, my God. They should ban movies like that. I don't care. They should get the biology right. It wouldn't hurt the movie to have the biology right. All right. Um, moving. Oh, and this is a great image. Um, so this is what happens with, if you can reproduce asexually, you reproduce like, um, what do you call it? <laughs> I lost my brain. Exponentially, uh, very quickly. Whereas if you reproduce um, sexually, and I, I don't like this diagram too much because it means, makes it seem like if you reproduce sexually, you would never increase your population size, which we know is not true. But if you are, yeah, if you're producing, males don't have offspring. So every time you produce a male, you've produced sort of a, um, a reproductive dead end. I mean, it, it, you know, genetic, genetically you need them around. To get reproduction to happen, you might need them around, but they don't actually have kids. So you've actually cut your reproductive population in half by having independent male and female genders. And yet, um, and, and that's important to understand because still so many organisms have adopted sexual reproduction. So it shows you how important the very, how much, how important the variation piece is and how it's not just, it's not just quantity, it's quality. It's getting a whole variety of different offspring um, by sexual reproduction is far more valuable <laughs> than producing lots of offspring and also the conditions vary. If, if things are good, asexual reproduction can be the way to go. Dominate the resource. If things start getting sketchy, um, you better start reproducing sexually because you want someone to survive. Maybe that's why there are so many babies born like nine months after a blackout or a blizzard or I don't know. Have you, did you know this? No. Oh, God, it's awesome. Look at the, look at the birth rates for humans, like in New York City or something, like some big population, and you'll see a blackout, and nine months later, there'll be this huge spike of babies. Lights go out, so everyone has sex, and all these babies get born nine months later. Or you'll have um, a blizzard. A blizzard's another one. There's gonna be a there's gonna be a spike in the in the babies nine months from three days ago, four days ago, because people are like stuck inside, and maybe even the power. And then if the power goes out. There's really nothing else. I mean, you know, you, you're stuck and you're inside. That's what people do. Um, it's pretty funny. You can you can actually watch it. It's um, if if you want to do another kind of amusing thing, you can count nine months back from your birthday and figure out what your parents were up to. It's 
It's kind of funny, too. I had a classmate who was born nine months after Valentine's Day. It's kind of amusing. Amusing. Um, all right. Sexual reproduction. Variation is the thing. Uh, bink. Where did we get here? All right. So I guess we're into female reproductive cycles a little bit. So females are doing ovulation. They're releasing eggs. Um, and that gets... There's all sorts of um, control and cycling that go along with that. Um, they're, and strat they're all different strategies. Um, what were we talking about? I was talking about... Hmm, what animal was it? Oh, pigs. No, I was talking to Ms. Wilkerson about pigs. Female pigs, if there's a male pig around, they'll ovulate like every 11 days until they get pregnant. Like they'll when and and that's not that uncommon, but a lot of the um, of the ungulates, the grazing animals, sheep, cows, deer, buffalo, things like that, they have a very strict schedule, and it's seasonal, because you don't want to have your calf, fawn, whatever, in the dead of winter. You want to have them right at the beginning of the spring. When, it's, when there's just enough food to feed them so they have the maximum time to mature before the next winter. So, so all the sheep, um, it, you can go watch them if you want. You can have a male, you can have a ram in with female sheep all year long and he'll check them out all the time. But if they're not ovulating, he won't try to have sex with them and they won't let him. It's kind of like, they're like, no, I'm not interested. He's like, yeah, you don't smell right. Next. And so he wanders around. Um, but then in the fall, um, all the female sheep, and it has to do with the weather and the timing, all the female sheep will come into, will come, it's called, they'll all ovulate at the same time, and the male sheep, they'll release pheromones. The male sheep will know, and he'll mate with as many of them as he can. So you'll have a ram who will like, you know, you watch his weight, and during the summer and spring and winter, he gets fatter and fatter and fatter. And then during the fall, he, like, loses 30 pounds because he's just chasing the females around all the time and having sex all the time. And then, then, then he goes back to just eating hay when they're done, after they're all pregnant. Um, so different, different thing. But that's so that the lambs are born, hopefully, at the end of the winter or the early spring, and then they have all season to mature before they have to face the next winter. Interesting. Um, oh, man. Some of the fishes and amphibians do weird things. Um, and some of them are asexual sometimes. And some of the, like the, we just saw this paper on snakes, and there's been a, we've known for a while now that Komodo dragons reproduce, uh, reproduce by, can reproduce by parthenogenesis. They can produce... An egg can result in a in a um, an adult, and I forget whether that adult is could be either gender or always male. Obviously, if you're a single female and you're going to produce offspring, you're going to want to put some males in there to you know fix the problem. Um, and I believe that's how it works. Um, so the oh the the egg gets formed by meiosis, but then the chromosomes redouble and make it have a diploid organism that has the same two sets of chromosomes. <coughs> and they can... Now, yeah, but it's cloning. You, you make an egg, so you've made an individual that's fundamentally different than any other individual. And then the egg doubles its DNA to become diploid. But that both sets of DNA are identical. So it just copies its DNA now. And it says, well, that's good. We've got enough DNA here. Make a new lizard. Make a new snake. So if you... So a, a, a snake produced by parthenogenesis should have the same amount of DNA as a plant as a snake produced sexually. But if you sequence that DNA, you would see that there is only really, there's a pair of identical chromosomes, which doesn't happen in any, there's no other way to get that than that, right? I mean, that, that's just odd. Um, all right. Um, that's pretty cool. Oh, oh, and I didn't understand this picture because I didn't read this piece of text. What was going on in this? I mean, I know they're having sex, but... 
an all-female lizard population, but they change from being male to female to male to female? Or do they? They act male. Oh, they act male to female, but they're still, those, those, see, those, these are parthenogenic lizards. Yeah. Oh. No, I don't think they're hermaphrodites. So they, their behavior is male-like or female-like, whether they want to be on top or on bottom, I guess, during this mating thing. But they're not, they're not actually doing sexual reproduction. They just think they are. Silly lizards. Um, but the, the interesting thing here is the, um, the middle graph, where estradiol is estrogen. And you know it, it comes up. You get ovulation at, at that point, and then progesterone comes up, um, and then they, and, you know, estrogen comes up, they ovulate again, and they keep cycling that way, um, and, and so you get these different behaviors, um, but they're reproducing by parthenogenesis. They just are confused. Um, all right? Silly lizards. Um, we talked about earthworms and hermaphroditism. Um, you'll often, or sometimes, not often, you'll hear about someone say that a human is hermaphro a hermaphrodite. That is not biologically true. You can't have both functional male and, repro male and female reproductive parts in a human. You can have ambiguous genitalia, where it's not clear what you got, but you can't functionally self-fertilize or do both. You can either function as a male or a female or neither which is often the case in, in those cases. Um, so that's good to know. Oh, and then there's sex reversals. I love that. Again, it doesn't happen in humans um, unless it's sort of surgical and that, that's a different whole thing. But frogs, um, if you have all female frogs, one of them will take a hit for the team and become a male. She'll just switch. No, if you have a large population of frogs and there's no males. I don't know how that would happen. But if you do, they'll, well, someone will switch. Yeah. You'll have, male, you'll have a female that can start producing sperm. No, no surgery required. Just boop, they do it. Just, yep. And it happens in, um, it says certain oysters, some coral reef fish, go female to male. Um, that was the whole problem in Jurassic Park. Uh, they used amphibian DNA to make the dinosaurs, which was stupid because dinosaurs aren't amphibians. But then they could get these sex reversals. Uh, they made all female dinosaurs. They said, "Well, we'll make, we'll be safe. We'll make all females. That way, they can't reproduce." But one of the females changed to a male, and they started having baby dinosaurs, and thing went rapidly awry. And the power went out, and there was the bad computer guy, and yeah, it's just. Is that what happened? Yeah. I never See? It's a good thing we're having this little discussion. Okay. Um, oh, mechanisms of fertilization are, there's a variety of mechanisms. External fertilization um, is a pretty common theme, um, especially in, in creatures that live in the water. So this is frog sex. The female releases eggs. The male releases sperm on the eggs. The eggs get fertilized, the eggs develop, and they make tadpoles. Um, the male is on top in this picture. And, but but why? she, why? Yeah. Well, it, it's, there's actually more to it than that. It's not, she won't just randomly release eggs unless there's a male around who's doing the right things for her. Like, you know, holding her just right. It's, it's, okay. yeah. And, and so she's releasing eggs, and she's on the bottom. She's bigger in this case, and he's smaller. Uh, I don't think that's always true with frogs, but in, in, in some species that's true. In some species, the female's bigger and the male's smaller. Um, it depends on what he's doing. Because like, these guys are just finding each other by sound at night or during the day in the pond. Oh, isn't that, you were talking about that last year. That's why frogs at night and the early morning are just like croaking. Oh, all the time. I mean, you, you go out in the spring. The day the ice goes out on our pond, every year, there's like a giant frog orgy. Like the frogs immediately know the day the ice goes out, and they are all out there. The little tiny, they're little tiny spring peepers. You, in fact, they're really hard to find. You have to go out with like a, a, a red shaded flashlight, and you have to sit there for a long time. 
And then you'll hear one peeping, and you can find them, and they're about as big as the tip of your little finger. And they make the little, the little peeper frogs, the, the first ones out in the spring. Um, and then there's other frogs that come out later. And there are people who can actually identify species of frog by the sound of their croak. They can tell whether they're listening to bullfrogs or tree peeper frogs or tree frogs or what kind they are. Pretty cool. Anyway, um, lots and lots of, or as soon as you move, oh, here's another one of those moved on to land themes. When you move on to land, external fertilization becomes far less acceptable. Um, in the water, you know, salmon, female releases eggs, male releases sperm, great, eggs get fertilized. All sorts of things can happen in the water because gametes, sperm can swim in the water, free-swimming gametes can meet in the water. If you're like a coral and you, you just release your gametes and they meet and they mate or they fuse. Um, but if you're going to go out on land, you got to keep, you got to come up with a better system. So internal fertilization is one of the big themes, of, is a theme of moving uh, onto land for animals. Um, what? Chicken. Chickens are, everything, everything that you're used to seeing is internally fertilized. Chickens are internally fertilized. Don't they use the colostrum? Well, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll get there in a second. So, yeah, male chickens have sex with female chickens. If you've had male chickens and female chickens around, you would have seen that because they do it all the time. Um, it's, it's worse for ducks, um, but if you have male and female ducks around, the male duck will like grab the female duck by the back of the head and push her under and have sex with her and then, you know, so on. It's, it's what ducks do. Um, all right, anyway. Um, and, and because internal fertilization is going on, again, there's all this other negotiation that has to happen. Um, through across the land animal species, the, 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 the trickiest one seems to be spiders because male and female spiders are predatory by nature. And trying to convince your potential mate that you are not a meal is tricky. That's the spider problem. So <clears throat> spiders have come up with a whole bunch of ways to, to work on that. Um, some, the male does become a meal. Black widow spiders are not called black widow spiders for nothing. Um, she mates and then she eats her partner. Why would they do that? Protein. No, but why would the male even agree to it? Um, Shouldn't they have learned by now? No, he can't. They can't learn. They mate once and then that's it. They're done. They can't pass that knowledge on to any. They can't warn someone. Yeah, you know. Um, but what? What's the point? Like, so you get to be an old celibate male spider. But some spiders have come up with ways to deal with that. Some male spiders will take a fly or a, an insect and wrap it in silk and present it to the female. And while she's unwrapping it and dealing with the fly, he'll mate with her and run away. <laughs> All right, that, that seems to work. But then there's the cheapskate spider, and I don't know what species it is, that actually just makes a ball of silk and hands it to her and has sex with her while she's unwrapping it before she realizes there's no bug inside, and then he runs away. That guy's smart. Yeah, well, a silk production takes a lot of energy, too. Yeah, but anyway, so uh, praying mantises also, the females will eat the males while they're, while they're having sex. It gets crazy. Yeah, they'll bite their heads off, and apparently that disinhibits some neurons so they mate better, and then they die. Huh, yeah, don't adopt these. None of these strategies are okay for people. <laughs> um, mm -mm. Yeah, we've already said that. More offspring can be produced than can survive. You want variation so that you know that at least some of them have a chance of surviving. Um, oh, if you want to do external fertilization, you're probably going to have to produce more gametes than internal fertilization, because internal fertilization, you're putting the gametes together. Um, more parental care for internal fertilization. Uh, oh, this is another big... Um, Huge land animal development thing. Number two here, the development of the amniote egg. Um, the amniotic egg changed the way that animals do reproductive business on land. Remember, amphibians, frogs, salamanders, toads, they struggle to produce offspring on land. 
They still have to do largely the external fertilization thing. And they, um, they lay their eggs in water. And then they, so frogs have to hang out by the water and salamanders have to find a moist place. And some of the toads have elaborate strategies to get around that, but they're still pretty awkward, like having the eggs laid on the back and growing skin over them um, to keep them moist. But if you're in the desert and you're a toad, that's really, you know, you're not going to find a nice pond somewhere in the desert. Um, nah, not really. But the amniotic egg changed that. The amniotic egg, um, you've all broken open eggs, I hope. Has everyone, everyone's broken open a chicken egg? Yeah. You know there's that white... It's a regular egg. You know there's like a, there's the shell, but then there's the white lining inside of it? That is a magical development in animals. That lining is similar to Gore-Tex. Everyone know what Gore-Tex is? It's, it's, it's waterproof but it's breathable so that it keeps the water of the egg from drying out, but it allows gas like oxygen to diffuse into the egg and carbon dioxide to diffuse out. So the or growing embryo inside that egg can do cellular respiration. Um, if you paint the egg and block all the little pores in the eggshell, bad. I mean, if you're trying to actually develop it as an egg, if you're doing it for easy. Most eggs you buy in the grocery store are not fertilized. Um, although you can eat fertilized eggs and you wouldn't necessarily know the difference. Um, if they had taken the eggs the day they were laid and refrigerated them, they won't develop, but they will be fertilized. Um, so that means that there's one more set of DNA in that egg. Um, yeah, okay. Um, so the amniotic egg that's in lizards or reptiles and birds changed the game on land. Um, some other um, uh, organisms l have an egg, but it stays inside the female. And there's a couple, some snakes do this, and some fish do this. Um, so there's a word for it, and it's just a cool word that, I'll put it up here. Um, it's OV. You've got the right spelling. Um, they lay eggs, but they give live birth. Over in Paris. <laughs> they lay eggs. I mean, they don't lay eggs. They make eggs, but they retain them inside the body of the female, and then they give birth to live young. Wait, they make eggs? Ovi, Paris. Yeah. Guppies do it. Uh, some sna garter snakes do it. You will actually, a garter snake actually gives birth to live garter snakes, but she does it by just keeping the fertilized eggs inside. Um, so is that like yeah. the next step towards the mother? Yes. Um, ostensibly, but not... It's, hap it's arisen independently several times. Like, guppies don't do it the same way that snakes do. Um, so oviviviparis. Um, viviparis means giving live birth. Um, yeah. Okay. Um... And, you know, the, if, if the parents survive, like salmon, they lay a boatload of eggs, they fertilize a boatload of eggs, and then the parents die. If you're a baby salmon, you will never, probably, uh, in some species of salmon, I think some salmon actually do go back to the ocean after they've laid their eggs. So they can do several seasons. But a lot of the salmon die. So a baby salmon, you're like an orphan, guaranteed, every time. I don't know. You probably would have different answers from different people. Uh, this is a picture of some kind of, this is a, like a giant water bug, and those are eggs that are laid all over its back. <coughs> so it's keeping hold of them, um, helping them perhaps avoid predation. Is that, that's a male? I don't know. In the book it says it's a male. Yeah. The female lays eggs on the male. Right. That happens with horse, uh, seahorses too. The male carries the eggs after he's mated with the female, and the female lays the eggs on him, or gives him the eggs, and then she swims off and finds another male. Eat them? I don't think so. I don't know. Seahorses seem fairly nonviolent to me, but you can never tell. This guy, on the other hand, is not necessarily nonviolent. It's kind of scary. All right. Um, 
So if you're going to have sexual reproduction, you have to produce gametes. Gametes are produced in organs called gonads. Gonads would be either ovaries or testicles or whatever it is that you're using to make your um, uh, gametes. <clears throat> oh, this again, different than um, humans. Female insects, like our friends the fruit flies, have a, uh, a storage area, area called a spermatheca. So when a female fruit fly has sex, she stores the sperm for the rest of her life and can use that sperm to fertilize her eggs for days and days and days and days, a month. Um, humans don't do that. Female, so the female fruit fly stores the male sperm. Yeah. And there was even a paper, well, you've, some of you read spatula theory. It's a hysterically funny paper. So it's in the sperm. Okay. It's a it's a it's a paper that I hand out when we talk about evolution with the with the regular biology about the evolution of the penis. It's absolutely hysterical. The guy is snakes a brilliant writer. What? Snakes have two. Oh yeah, right. Snakes have two. They have one for left side mating and one for right side mating. But uh, so there's this whole paper about and the, like why birds don't have penises, except ducks. I think ducks do. Ducks Chickens don't. Have Oh, to extend their penis? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. There's so many things I don't know. But anyway, I know that chickens don't have penises. They have to like line up two holes. And then the male puts in sperm, and the sperm will fertilize multiple, well, will fertilize a bunch of eggs. Because the female, in a chicken, they only have one ovary and one oviduct, and it's like an assembly line. Why do eagles have to do it? <laughs> Thrill-seeking? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure they do. Maybe no, that's do. maybe that's just been they, seen they sometimes, and we think that's the only way they do it. Maybe sometimes they just like, you know, cuddle up in the nest together. Who knows? I don't know. There's so much out there. There's only so much biology I can know. Um, all right. There's a, there's a picture of that. These are this is the queen honeybee, um, and she's got that right the orange thing, the orange ball way over on the right is where she stores sperm for all of her eggs. And then it's a male honeybee on the left with all of his parts. Um, and I think they may have sex while they're flying, too. But they might not. I don't know all the details of honeybees. They're complicated. Um, parasitic flatworms. There's not much to them except for their reproductive system and their eating <clears throat> system. Um, but they don't need much because they just live inside you and you provide them with a continuous un interrupted supply of food, and all they need to do is reproduce and eat. Um, oh, and these are obviously hermaphroditic, right? Because they've got both male and female parts. Pretty cool. Unless one of them's inside you. What is that thing? I know it's a parasitic flatworm, but which one? Yeah. All right, we're just going to go away. Oh, yeah. Yeah, a lot of organisms, someone put, brought, Doug brought this up earlier, birds, reptiles, um, they only have one opening, a common urogenital opening called the cloaca. So that's where their urinary waste comes out, where their reproductive efforts come out or go in. And then also that's where feces would come out. One opening for everything. Works for them. What? <coughs> well, they have a mouth. Yeah, they're putting food in the mouth. But then... But then yeah, just one opening. Whereas you guys respectively either have two or three, which is kind of interesting. Males, you use the same urethra for urination and ejaculation. Females, you have three separate openings, one for reproduction, one for urination, one for defecation. And they're separate, more or less, from each other. Um, oh, that's sad. Monogamy, relatively rare among animals. Um, um, well, yeah. So, um, monogamy means you stay with one mate for your whole life, or only one mate. Is that the intent on humans? There's no intent. There's just the result. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so a lot of the birds do monogamy, 
at least for a while. I mean, or serial monogamy, so they'll have one mate, and they won't mate with anyone else unless that one dies. Uh, well, again, if, if the biggest problem facing your reproduction is survival of your offspring, having two parents around can be better than one. <coughs> Penguins. Uh, a lot of birds. A lot of birds do that. They, both parents contribute to raising a fairly small number of offspring, defending the nest, protecting the young, and that's how you get reproductive success. There are all sorts of variations on the theme, though. Cuckoos. Do you all know what cuckoos are up to? Cuckoo goes to another bird's nest, pushes the eggs out, and lays its own eggs in the nest and leaves. And the other parents are, uh, don't understand. Or no, they will, they'll just lay an egg in, another egg in another parent's nest. That other parent will incubate the eggs. The cuckoo will hatch out first and push the other eggs out of the nest. And then the parents will just feed that one bird and think it's theirs. Birds aren't always clever. <coughs> Um, just like a female, if you, you can, th oh, this is fun. You can do this. This is, um, if you have a female chicken who's broody, who like wants to sit on eggs, you can put any eggs you want under her and she'll hatch them. Ducks, chickens. Ostrich. Well, <laughs> no, that wouldn't really work because she doesn't, you know, produce enough heat. But so uh, some kid told me a story about raising a clutch of ducks hatched by a chicken. And the little ducks imprint. They imprinted on the chicken, so they'd follow her around wherever she went. And that's fine, because that's what they're kind of supposed to do, right up until the point where they got near the pond. And all the ducks oh, jumped yeah. in the water and started swimming along, and the mother chicken flipped out. <laughs> she would like run along the edge of the lake, and they'd kind of follow her in the water, and that's about as close as they could get. It, it had some real problems socially with that particular. But as far as the raising children go, it was OK. Um, Yeah, and there is, there are some, um, there's a whole bunch of social stuff that goes on with animals to try to make sure that your children are your children, especially for males. Like you get that gorilla guy over there. See that skull? He's totally fearsome looking. He's totally a vegetarian. Um, all of that is just so that he can fight off other male gorillas so that he can maintain his harem of females that he mates with exclusively. Although they've done DNA testing and they know that actually doesn't work. Like he thinks he's the one mating with all the females and all the other males are sort of staying around the edges but the females mate around the edges and they produce, yeah, it's, it's amusing. That happens with birds too. Um, I don't remember what this story was. <coughs> What oh, it's saying that they can't mate again. Oh, yeah, that was You know how the flies had to be, like, that was yeah. the experiment for, like, the first flies in the, like, if the person on the male side was there, if the eggs that were produced were there, so what they mate. Are essentially females <laughs> lacking sperm in spermathesia? If they're not mated, 5% lack sperm in their spermathesia. How did they, how did the 5%, mm, Control not remated. Huh. Weird. I don't fully get the experiment. Hmm. I'd have to read more about it. I missed the reading part. All right. All right, now we go into the human reproductive system, my favorite. Um, so you've been... So the, the funny thing about the reproductive system is it's just embarrassing to teach. No, it's fine. It's fine to teach, but it's, you're in high school, so all of you guys are at like slightly different places in the whole run of this, and that's why it's kind of amusing because some of you are like, yep, I understand that, I understand that, and some of you are like, I had no idea, and that's weird. It's better than teaching it to freshmen, though, which is oh, it's awful. Teaching to juniors and seniors isn't that quite so bad. Um, all right, well, we'll go through anatomy. So there's the female picture. Um, and we went through this with regular biology in detail. We played pin the tail on the parts. It was 
awkward because most of the juniors can't really put the parts on all the pieces. Um, but that's the way it works. Um, female, they always do side view, front view. Um, but it's important to see how far down in your pelvis all of this is. Um, you've got, oh, look, a skeleton right here. So your pubic bone is way down here. All of this stuff is sitting here. Um, in order for you to damage your reproductive system, you have to do something really, really bad. Like, you have to break your pelvis. And at that point, that's probably one of the least of your worries. Um, even developing embryos are really well protected. Um, in order to have an accident that damages a baby in the first trimester or maybe even into the second trimester. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's, it's only like when you're pretty far along and, you know, it's sitting out here that then you've got some, some more issues. But, but boy, babies are really well protected. Um, so two ovaries. Uh, where is it? Here we go. Okay, two ovaries. Um, and they're going to cycle through releasing eggs. And that's going to be controlled by hormones. And we'll spend a little bit more time on the hormones because that's really what you're probably going to get tested on, although you should know sort of what's what inside. Um, and I'm not necessarily sure whether there's a strict alternation between ovaries, like you release one egg every 28, every 56 days from one ovary and the other egg. I think there's a bunch of eggs that get ready and one gets released. Obviously, there are women who release more than egg, one egg at a time, because you get fraternal twins. That's two eggs, two sperm, two different kids, only as related as siblings, but they just happen simultaneously. Um, so that's that. Is uh, the twins have the same sperm? Too? Yeah, same egg, same sperm. It starts to divide. So two eggs. One egg, one sperm. Oh, and then it starts to divide? Zygote, two cells, four cells, eight cells, somewhere in there, two, four, eight, 16, 32, some of that... Some split occurs, and it's not necessarily just, it could be just one cell splits off or a bunch of cells splits off. No, they don't know how, they don't know exactly what the mechanism for that is. Yeah, and, 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 and identical twins are so rare, um, but they do run a little bit in families, so maybe. Yeah, my family has so many Oh, baby. <laughs> watch, <laughs> watch out. <laughs> uh, identical or fraternal? Yeah, it's, apparently the genetics of those are quite different. Wait, so she popped out one kid and then six days later? No. no. Oh, okay. Oh, I was like, had identical I twins six days apart? Like <laughs> How many aunts and uncles do you have? My mom has six siblings. Wow. But my dad only has one. one. But my grandfather had 14. So. Wow. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's a lot of kids. That's, you get to the point with that many where the older kids raise the younger kids. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they're like out of the house and married by the time the last, yeah. That's, that's wild. But it works. Um, so eggs are going to leave. Oh, let's see if there's a better picture here. Oh, here we go. Better picture. So eggs are going to, wait, there we go. Eggs leave the oviduct. They get wafted into the oviduct. This oviduct might be only as big in diameter as uh, the opening in the oviduct may only be as big as the diameter of a, of a hair. It's a small tube. The eggs travel down. They get carried along by cilia. And they need to get fertilized. If they're going to get fertilized, they need to get fertilized in the oviduct. They, if they get to the uterus and they're not fertilized, they're done. Game over. Um, that's a misconception. People think that conception happens in the uterus. It's not true. Yeah, this, um, Mr. Alfred was telling us about something where it's really rare, but Ectopic pregnancy? Yeah. yeah, that's bad. So that's when the egg gets fertilized up here in the oviduct and then tries to implant in the oviduct. Clearly, there's not enough room in the oviduct to produce 
<clears throat> a baby. So they have to, that's, that requires surgery. They have to remove that because it will destroy, it, it will do a lot of damage to the reproductive system. Um, so ectopic pregnancies happen, um, but they're relatively rare. Um, the uterus is a muscle. Uh, again, it's, you know, this size, a little, it's, it's not that big. Um, but it changes a whole bunch during the 28-day cycle. It, uh, the endometrium is the lining, and that lining um, regrows cells and its blood supply every 28 days. If an embryo implants, it continues to grow that lining and develops the placenta. If nothing implants, then it sheds that lining and you start again. That's not normal for all animals. That's very rare for animals. Um, like the, the, the grazing animals, if they don't get um, fertilized, they just reabsorb it and start again. They don't, they don't bleed, they don't, which is probably good. Out on the prairie, you don't want coyotes to know that that's, that's a dead giveaway. So, and mice, they just reabsorb it, put it back out again. Um, humans, they don't. Um, primates, I, I guess, don't. Um, all right. Um, the opening between the vagina and the uterus is the cervix. Um, why people get, why there's, why cervical, oh, that's where, um, they know why, that's the answer. <clears throat> Human papillomavirus, um, probably all of you guys have been, all the girls and increasingly now boys are getting um, immunized against it. That virus, among other things, infects cells in the cervix and causes them to have a much higher rate of cervical cancer. Cervical cancer shouldn't kill you, but if you let it metastasize and move to other parts of your body, it could kill you. So um, they've developed the Gardasil vaccine, which prevents three of the more, three or four of the more common forms of HPV, um, and they think will have a significant impact on cervical cancer. That's when they do a pap test. If you've had that, eventually you probably will. They just take a, a sample of the cells off the cervix and they look at them under the microscope and they make sure that they don't look like they are abnormal, like cancerous. And taking a sample like that, I mean, it's like, you know, when we did cheek cells and you just took cheek cells and it, it, getting cells is about that easy. Um, so that's what's going on there. Um, there are some birth control techniques that like the diaphragm and the cervical cap that cover the cervix and prevent, try to prevent sperm from getting up into it, but none of them are that effective. That's, that was birth control in the 60s and 70s, and lots of kids got born around it. Um, one that they, oh, uh, intrauterine devices is, is a really common and um, maybe gaining form of birth control right now, especially in women who've already had kids. And they take a small, I think they're T-shaped um, device, and they actually put it up in your uterus. And that is a, like, as it works about as well as the pill, except you don't have to do anything. It's just there. But it works better um, in women who have had children before Although I think they're starting to put them more in, in anybody now. Um, they release a little bit of hormone, and they just block implantation, and they're one of the better birth control techniques out there right now. Uh, <clears throat> indeed. All right, we'll do the mail. On the other side. <coughs> no, looks like I feel a bit more female. Okay. Oh, we'll stop this. Uh, hmm. okay. I don't think that recorded. It didn't record. No, 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 no. There's a little pause button at the top of your computer. Is that good? No. Yeah. No, over the like, yes. Yeah, no, I can't see that on my computer. Click. Click no, that's a shadow. It's not a pause button. That's, that's a shadow. Oh. Yeah, I'm just like, it's not on my screen. Wait, what about just 
directly to the other to the next side of the what looks like a clock button. That other thing, what is that? That's that's angry parrot. What if you minimize it? It's weird. Usually it just. Use four fingers to drag. Yeah, you should put it on the next one because I'm not seeing it here. Right. Me too. Oh, I'm working on it. Okay. Wow. Have a lovely yeah. ski race or a competition or whatever you're doing. Basketball. <sighs>